Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the New Ridgeline Podcast. I'm Devin Dunnigan, and here with me, as always, is Mr. Stephen Mott. How you doing, brother? I'm just doing great to just to be back to the podcast. Yep, brother this is Jake, the, brother this is the first, brother. <laughs> this is the first episode we've done in a very, very long time, about a, about a month, actually, but... Yeah, we're back with another episode, and today we are going to be reviewing the 1997 album 20 by Leonard Skinner. So this was released April 29th, 1997, produced by Josh Leo, recorded in Muscle Shoals Sound Studio, Muscle Shoals, Alabama. And the title itself acknowledges 20 years since the infamous plane crash that claimed the lives of three of the members of the band, Ronnie Van Zant, Cassie Gaines, and Steve Gaines. And this featured a brand new lineup. And it's this is kind of an interesting record in terms of the lineup because you have Ricky Metlock of Blackfoot, and he had played with the band back way back in the day before the first album he was actually on like Leonard Skinner's first and last and then the complete first album that came out in like 2001 or so it's actually a really cool record I mean it's just basically an extension of the first and last record with a lot of demos and stuff like that but Ricky Medlock was a prominent part of that era and then Huey Thomason of the Outlaws said they kind of formed sort of a super group with this particular album. And it, it's very interesting. I mean, it, this is a very just overall to me, interesting record to look at. And all of the post crash albums are kind of interesting to me, just in kind of the general way they turned out and what the band seemed to be going for. And to me, they seem with this album and I, I'm not, I'm not sure how Steven looks at this record yet we've kind of talked a little bit about it before we started recording but to me this is more of kind of a return to form for the band I mean I don't know how Steven feels about it but to me this is like kind of them going back to the classic Skinner I think they tried with the last rebel and then they kind of went a little bit back with endangered species but this was the one where I think they kind of said, we're going in with a kind of a general, I guess, mantra, and we're going to try to do that. And I'm not going to spoil what I think of this record, but I, I just will say I like this record. I, I, I do like this record, but we'll get more into it as we go through each track, because I don't think this album is perfect. And that's, that's kind of an understatement, I'll be honest and say. But this is the ninth studio record, the fourth post-crash album, and this was released on the CMC International record label. And I, the cover of the album is actually pretty cool with the faces and the rocks and stuff like that. That I, I really like that. I think that's that's really really cool. But just as far as how I kind of discovered this record, it was getting into Skinner and I remember supposedly my parents used to have this record, but somehow lost it. And I remember watching the Behind the Music, which was made around the time of this record's release. And I remember hearing songs off of it. And in particular, one that's probably the most well-known song. And I, I wanted to hunt this album down. Eventually, I bought the record. And I, I listened to it here and there. It is one that I do kind of frequently listen to. But... As for the post-crash lineup, I mean, every album is pretty much a different lineup for the most part, which is kind of, you, you can't get used to a lineup with this band, especially in the post. Well, I mean, not even in the post-crash. I mean, pre-crash, there was kind of a lineup change on each album. But, I mean, Stephen, what, what is your thoughts on the album kind of going into it? Where, how did you discover this record, et cetera, et cetera? Well, the openings that we always do, uh, on this glorious podcast today, <laughs> um, on this today, which is May, what, 8th? Yeah, Sunday, May 8th, being recorded. And uh, anyway, 
So, uh, I mean, Devin, Devin's kind of talked about this record before, but I, I'm not altogether really familiar uh, with the post plane crash stuff. Maybe aside from God and Guns and maybe 91 Skinner. But uh, <clears throat> there was a uh, compilation. I guess you'd call it a compilation. Um, shoot, I can't even. I think it was called Nothing Comes Easy or something like that. But I heard this this album wasn't on it, but I heard The Last Rebel on it. And uh, I didn't quite catch on to it that well at the time. But um, and I and I guess this this record maybe is kind of I think of in the same type vein. But uh, I'll get into the the details of that later on. But uh, I just I don't know. I mean, I've definitely never heard this much before. Now, you know, maybe bits and pieces here and there just to try it out. I just got bored very quickly and went on, but. Anyway, so <clears throat> this is from 1997, I believe, here. Uh, I guess seeing the 77 was the plane crash makes sense. But um, anyway, I do like, <clears throat> I know it's a weird time to talk about the album cover probably, but we I feel like we usually talk that, about that later on. But I kind of like the album cover, uh, kind of like the faces in the background and stuff. That's pretty cool to me. But anyway, so back to you, Devin. All righty, so let's go ahead and dive on into the first track on here. So we ain't much different. So this was co-written with former guitarist Mike Estes, who was in the band from, I believe, 94 to 95. And this is a band-written track, so no outside songwriters. Me, a great opener and a really good song. I, I really like the way this album sounds starting off. The production is very raw, which I think lends itself to the music. And to me, this is classic st type Skinner. I think I could see the pre-crash lineup doing something similar to this. Was played live as the opener to the show, and it, re it went really well live and some really good guitar work on here. I like the kind of throwing it to different guitar players throughout the song. I like that a lot. And it, I put on here, the guitar army is back and drummer Owen Hill. He does really good on here. He kind of, he's very simplistic in his style, but I think it does lend itself well to the sound. I mean, he, he's a really, really good drummer. He's a renowned session drummer and I think he does really well. This was his second album with the band. He played on Endangered Species prior to it and played on, of course, on that tour and all. But yeah, I, I really like this song. I think this is a good opener to the album. I will say I think it does go over a bit better live than in the studio, but that's just my opinion. So, Stephen, take We Ain't Much Different. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I can I can totally see how that, that would be a, you know, a band – Comp composition or however you however you want to say that uh but i'm probably saying that wrong but anyway so i mean basically yeah this song is a good opener and uh when you hear it when it first comes on and you hear it it's like well this is this might be a good album <laughs> but um i mean later on you're just like well i just don't know anymore but uh, besides that, uh, I, the song itself is really good, and uh, but to me, it kind of it, it kind of they kind of get away from that style of songwriting or or you know just that that type of thing. The whole vibe of the album to me kind of goes. It starts with one thing, and then it kind of goes to something else, and it keeps changing and changing, and uh, it seems like that they kind of had been working this up for a long time. And I don't know if that's really true, but it seems to me like if records are kind of like that, where, they, where the songs kind of vary a whole lot, you know, song to song, that with the sound, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it seems to me like that they probably had been working this stuff up for a while. 
and been planning this stuff out and all that. And that's kind of Skinner's style. Like I remember hearing a hearing a, a Ronnie Van Zant interview to where I mean I know obviously he didn't have anything. Well, he I mean he didn't have anything to do with this record. Ronnie didn't obviously, but it, I mean that's just kind of the band's overall style. He said that they like it better when they have a whole lot more time to think about what they're doing and 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 put their songs together, you know. And because the way Skinner thinks about stuff is, especially the older style Skinner, is like they'll work on like a song and they'll just keep going and going and going until they get it perfect and they play it that same exact way every time. Now for the later stuff, you know, kind of carries it kind of carries over, but in a way not because it's outside songwriters. It kind of adds a weird element to it to me. But uh, anyway, <laughs> that was a long rant. But you know, I got I got to save some comments for later, I guess. But I guess that's what I'm trying to get at <clears throat> is that the band likes it better when they're able to think something out very, very, very thoroughly. But anyway, so back to you, Devin. So bring it on. So a good one-two punch with this track and the previous. This kind of reminds me a bit of 38 Special and the way it sounds. I think it went over really well live. As a matter of fact, it went better live than in the studio. I think this version kind of is a bit stale. Once again, this sounds like something classic Skinner would have done and written entirely by the band. This is a band track and no outside songwriters. Some great guitar work on this track, a great solo by Billy Powell on the keyboards. Very simplistic in its arrangement. I mean, this is kind of a, this is probably the most straightforward song on the record. Kind of my, reminds me lyrically of Give Me Three Steps, I believe during the, the last verse of the song. Filler, but good filler in my opinion. One of the songs that could have fit right at home on 91 of The Last Rebel. I think this could have just you could have took this off of here. It, it kind of sounds like what they were doing on those records. And I love the ending solo with the guitar, guitars taking turns, which is very much like the old school Skinner. So, Stephen Take, bring it on. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to press the button later. But <clears throat> anyway, so bring it on. Uh, you know, I mean, this is one that particularly – that I that I started to wonder who who was the third guitarist involved because you know I, I got to thinking and I I looked at the description and it said Ricky Medlock and I said well I know it ain't Gary and I know it ain't Ricky playing I, I didn't think it was Ricky playing this certain guitar part and I was like hmm. Because it sounded like this uh, cleaner tone to it. And I was like, that's got to be somebody else. But I never knew I never knew they had a, a different guy. Because uh, I thought it was always, um, I don't know his name, but this long-haired guy. Well, they all probably got long hair, but that's probably not a good way to describe it. But <laughs> it's this guy, I, I can picture him in my head, but he's, he's the third guitarist that's with him now. But besides gary and ricky but anyway uh it kind of adds that third element like the kind of st what i'm trying to say is the guy that kind of replaces steve Gaines, you know the third element because ricky always has been enthralled with you know alan collins and playing his parts and obviously gary you know being gary so <laughs> but um you can, and that's another point I'd like to make, is that Gary, you can hear Gary playing all, I mean, you can hear him from a mile away all over this record. And Ricky, and Ricky Medlock, really not as much. You know, I mean, he, you can probably hear him, but he's not, he's not as distinct. And he, I don't think he had as much of an impression on this album as he would the later stuff. If that, if that makes any sense. And um, I, I don't really know how long he had been involved with them at this point, you know, 
you know, actually being in the band the second time around, I guess you, the, the way I should say it, but I mean, but anyway, this song in particular is actually not bad. I could, I mean, I could stand it, you know, but it's not going to just blow anybody away or anything. And the rest, and and the rest of this album sure ain't after this, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, besides the point. So back to you, Dev. So <laughs> Voodoo Lake. So this is not a Skinner song. It isn't terrible, but it sounds more like something Kenny Wayne Shepherd or or like '90s Molly Hatchet, and. I like the song, but they could have left it off the record. And this is the problem with a lot of post-crash Skinner albums. They just don't sound like Skinner. I mean, there's there's too much. And I'm kind of jumping forward in my notes here. There's too many outside songwriters on these albums. And I just think that detracts more than it does enhance the songs. And some good atmosphere on this one. Some good slide work. Was performed live. And I think it did go over better live than in the studio. Too theatrical for Skinner, in my opinion. This is, this, like I said earlier, it's not a Skinner song to me. Could have been released as a single, maybe for the country market or, or maybe like blues market or something. And yeah, just not a fan of this song. So Steve, take Voodoo Lake. Voodoo Lake. Should have. It should have been doo doo lake. It was bad. Oh, I mean, I just don't know. Um, but I mean, third track on the album, and there's already bird noises in it. I mean, what? I mean, why? I mean, no, because Voodoo Lake. Oh, uh, I mean. This is where the album starts to go down and where I start to go. What, what am I, what, like what band even am I listening to? This whole record to me, it started reminding me a little bit of Molly Hatchet in some ways, but only kind of, it's something about, it's something about Johnny Van Zant's songwriting and the lyric or either who was whoever was coming up with lyrics that reminded me of Molly Hatchet song throughout this whole record there's some of the th- some of the themes and stuff like uh there was there was a couple of ones in particular but I can't remember exactly but there was a couple of ones that I was like man this is just like Molly Hatchet with some of the themes and stuff of it but I mean and and too, when you said that about the thirty eight special, you know that does that does kind of make sense. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that was probably done kind of purposely a little bit. Uh, and I mean, other than that, I mean, Voodoo Lake. I, I mean, it wasn't like I, I kind of like the uh, riff and stuff, but. It, it, after a while, you start going, well, okay, that's, it's one of those songs where you, where you get the gist of it pretty quick, and then it just kind of repeats itself over and over, and you're like, well, okay, I, 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 I got you, I, I got it, you know, uh, we're on, <laughs> but uh, that's another point, all these songs are, you know, well, <laughs> well, thought out and well well i won't say thought out i'll say drawn out <laughs> maybe not thought out as much but i don't think there's a song under three minutes three and a half minutes well there is but 326 i think maybe the maybe the shortest song but uh besides the point the point is this song is not really up to par with uh Skinner stuff and really none of that none of the stuff is much except for traveling man obviously because that is Skinner original stuff but anyway and uh, that's that's kind of coming later but that's you know that's just what I think about it traveling man 
probably the best song on here, <laughs> honestly. But back to you, Devin. So we'll get there. But I will say this just to, as like a kind of the, to add to you a little bit. This song doesn't involve any member of Skinner except Johnny Van Zandt. So if that's saying anything at all. So the next track on here is Home is Where the Heart Is. So the intro with the piano reminds me a lot of Zeppelin. Don't ask me why, but it reminds me of Zeppelin. And the typical ballad during this time, I like the solo after the opening a lot. This is kind of a rip off of Stairway to Heaven or musically. Should have been a huge hit and a crossover with late 90s country radio. Good guitar and piano solo, and this was written entirely by the band. So I really enjoy this song. And to me, this is where a ballad like this works a lot. And yeah, Stephen Take, Home is Where the Heart Is. Hmm. Okay, well, oh my, my, my. And, I mean, okay, home is what hard is. <laughs> Sorry, I had to call. So, all right, it's, it just struck me as kind of strange. And after a while, this record is not a joy to listen to. And that's verbatim notes, chapter one for today, boys and girls. Um, and, uh, it pretty much, um, I mean, you you get a glimpse of what what this this album is is going to turn into a lot later on, <laughs> and it's like, I, I mean, I don't know. Like this song is, if I had to guess, it would be outside of songwriters, but it's it's like this this song is just so far out there to me. Production wise and songwriting wise and everything, it's just like all over the place to me. It's like they, it's like for this whole record, I'll make this comment too, just about the whole record in general. Gary Rosington, I mean, get, I mean, guitar wise, you can hear him all over this record. I mean, but it's like. He, that style, his style of playing is really goes really good with 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 the original, you know, LS stuff. But with this stuff, it's like it's more commercialized. But yet he's still playing the same stuff over it, that the same style stuff. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that until you start trying to do that over different stuff like this commercial stuff and that's why it doesn't work because Gary Rosington is going to play like Gary Rosington and he's not going to change <laughs> and but the songwriting style is and it's not something that say Ed King or or Alan Collins or somebody came up with a riff they came up with so it's going to sound different and I mean I know that it's, I mean, change is, is just going to happen, but, I mean, I just don't really like it. I mean, <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's just not that good. It's just not up to par. And it's like they was trying so desperately to make a good record, but... All righty, so the next track on here is Traveling Man. So... This was released with an accompanying music video. This is the most well-known song off the record, originally featured on the One More from the Road album and from 1976. We reviewed that album way back in the day. Check that out on the old channel, which it'll soon be up on the new channel. Features a duet between Ronnie and Johnny Van Zant. I love this song. It's a very well-done rendition and the very first studio recording of this song that I know of. I don't know if they ever recorded this back in the seventies or not. I'm pretty sure they didn't. And this is tied. I, I said the previous song was the best song. It, it, this is probably the second best or either tied as the best song on the record for me. And it's kind of hard to screw up because it's a classic Skinner song and they, they pretty much perform it note for note as the original. And this is still performed today. 
and the drumming on this song stuck out to me a lot. I, I thought that was really cool. And that, that's kind of the interesting thing about it. It's not as tight sounding as the 76 version, but I mean, it, it's still pretty much note for note, the original version, but it's just kind of, it has a looser vibe to it kind of ryth rhythm wise or, or groove wise, however you want to say it. But yeah, I, I, I like this song a lot. I, I've always really dug traveling, man. And just kind of a, as a footnote to the previous song, where this sounds like Skinner, the previous song, I will be honest, didn't sound like Skinner. So, I mean, it's kind of out there for Skinner song. So, Stephen Tate, Traveling Man. Well, Traveling Man uh, is all I'll ever be. Um, and, I mean, because this was on the live record. And uh, I just wonder what the what the process was there like they were sitting around going hmm we we got about halfway through the record so oh you know what we got a song that we hadn't put on studio yet and are recorded in the studio so let's do that one exactly note for note like the live version and i'm just like okay that's kind of like defeating the purpose to me of the whole of what their what the whole idea of the record was it seems like i mean it's called 20 years you know 20 20 years after the crash but yet all the other stuff is outside songwriters well some of it is and it sounds like something totally different than the original stuff and i, I mean it seems like that the rest of the album they're trying to, to be new and come up with something different but yet still have the same some of the same band members and stuff some but um it just it's just not a good mix to me i mean it's just not it, no it's just i mean I, it's, it's like their thought process wasn't really all the way straight with what they were trying to do <clears throat> i mean traveling man is is a good song and all but I mean, I guess it was a good way to kind of kind of honor the legacy or whatever, however you want to say it. You get what I'm saying, but I mean, you know, to have a song from it. But I mean, I, honestly, like I think they would have been better off doing covers rather than some of this stuff on here, like because some of this stuff just ain't that good like they i mean i would have preferred covers over some of this stuff like like say like the live album for example from 76 i guess it was they did like crossroads and you know like covers that they are had already recorded in the studio but like to a certain extent if you don't have anything good like original just just come just pull something else like that out of it to me but i mean i don't know it's just me but so this song is not good so back to you devin all righty i figured that was your favorite song but all right so the next track on here is talk talked myself right into it Oh my, this is Filler with a capital F, the typical boogie rocker. I don't hate this song. The chorus is fun, was performed live very briefly. I think it was kind of put into the set during the latter part of the tour. But I believe during the tour, I believe the, during the 98 leg of the tour, they swapped drummers. They brought in another guy who didn't last long. A good slide solo, it's kind of a, just a fun kind of song. The verse melodies, eh. And the outside songwriters strike again. I don't believe there's only Johnny Van Zandt involved in the songwriting and Donnie Van Zandt's involved, but the other two guys are not even, I, I don't even know who, know who those guys are. And... 
the ending of the song where he says, I can't believe I did that. Oh, my. Once again. Oh, my, 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 my. I mean, why do that? That's cringe. And I, I put if this was the only filler, that would have been fine. But there's some more filler coming up. So Stephen Take talked myself right into it. Well, I mean, no. I mean, this is three minutes and 26 seconds long. And, um, I mean, it's just dumb. Like, Johnny Van Zant, it's just like he's, I mean, when he says talk myself right into it, it's just weird. Like, I, it just doesn't seem like anything. No content, because, I mean, no. This is like commercialized, modern bullcrap. This is, no. This is like a clashing of interest, and Johnny Van Zant. uh, he, 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 I I mean, no. This is not, this is not anything good at all. To never again be played on the face of Mars. This is this is just too long because zero percent zero seconds would be too long. So back to you, Devin. All righty. <laughs> so the next track on here is never too late. So this is more like it. I dig it. The atmospheric thing done right. As I said, there was some good atmosphere on Voodoo Lake. This is, to me, that song done right. Kind of reminds me a bit of Zeppelin once again. I dig the groove of this song. I like the bridge, which kind of reminds me of something like That Smell or the Blackfoot cover of Wishing Well. And a great solo. It splits it up between the guitarist, which is what I like, and gives off kind of a team effort vibe. Written entirely by the band, and kind of it's kind of the free bird of this album, somewhat. So, Stephen Take, Never Too Late. Oh, it's too late, all right. Because <laughs> uh, this one was not good. Bernice was not good. None of us are free. It's not good. <laughs> now, see, we forget. It's not good. Now, I'm just playing. Uh, I mean, no, this 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 record, as it goes on, it's like a roller coaster of up and down and changing this and that. No. Uh, it just, no. No, 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 because they said they was going to do one thing, and they did something else, because it said it will, and it won't, and and, and that's just what gets on my nerves. That's just my pet peeve, is that when people say they will, but they really won't, and um, I, I I, I agree with Gene Simmons when he says that, because that that's that's what the term I'm going to use for this record that describes it. I mean, this Kiss song called No, No, No describes this record. And, I mean, I 100% agree with Gene Simmons. And uh, Van Halen Balance is a very good album. And it's a lot better than this record. And um, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm playing. So, anyway, so basically this song, no, no. Back to you, Devin. <laughs> all righty so the next track on here is ORR so an abbreviation for outlaws renegades and rebels I, I don't get it I mean they did the same thing on the next record they had a song called get it while they're getting as good which is like W-I-G-H-T-E-B or something like that I don't even know and it, that it's just it, it don't work just call it outlaws renegades rebels or you could have just done ORR and then put it in parentheses or something. But this, I mean, it's, it's like you have to listen to the song to figure out what the hell the 
the freaking song is about. So once again, kind of gives me a vibe of Zeppelin at the beginning of it. Eh, but I mean, it, it's filler, but passable, I guess. I get the gist, but whatever. Basically a remake of the previous song. And the bridge reminds me of Blackfoot, written entirely by the band. So you got the band to blame on this particular song. Good guitar solos and doesn't add anything to the record. Could have been cut off the record. And yeah, I mean, this album is 12 songs. I think they could have cut it down to like eight or nine or something like that. Or maybe maybe 10. I don't know. But hey, they could have cut some songs off this record. I probably think this would have been a good eight song album or something like that. And I do like the syncing of the guitars and vocals at the end. I actually think that works pretty decent. So take this song, Stephen. Well, uh, this, this song should have been called OMC OMR. And uh, instead of ORR, uh, and really, I think I kind of agree. Like the, the whole abbreviation is just thing is just kind of dumb. But uh, I mean, we're getting to the latter half of this record now, and I'm about to, uh, to honest, honestly, about the second or third song, I was ready for it to be over. But uh, when I was listening to it, but unfortunately, that was too good to be true. Uh, because it wasn't, and um, so I made it true, and I, I I pressed the stop button, and I stopped it, and so. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, this this song is not nearly as good as the next song, which is blaming on a on a sad song, which is a good song, and uh, this 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 track, I mean. It's not even on the album. Like, it's, it's not, a, it's just a delusion of crap because it's not on the record and uh, it's, it's not. So back to you, Devin. <laughs> All righty. So, let me know a sad song. AKA blame it on a bad song. So ballad time again. Oh my, not bad, not horrible. I, I, it's, it's stupid filler to me. A rewrite of the song from the last rebel called a love. Don't come easy. This sounds like Skinner going alternative or grunge with a little bit of a mix of like the country of that time period, country music of the time period. Not like a country, not like the, we're, we're going to Europe. Hey, we're gonna mix Europe in here, and I mean, stupid joke, but not a favorite of mine. Kind of boring. Could have been cut off the record. Some good guitar work in here, and it's also kind of reminds me of the song "Road to Nowhere" by Ozzy Osbourne. And now the ending of the song is a remake of "Stairway to Heaven." So this seems like a lot of freaking Zeppelin influence on here. Even in the way the album sounds, production-wise, it kind of gives me a a Zeppelin vibe. And this was written entirely by the band, so. Yeah, no outside songwriter. So you have the band to blame here. So Stephen Tate, blame it on a bad song. Uh, yeah, I mean, that sounds like a, a good, a good song name. Blame it on the band because that's the that's the theme and the mantra of this whole review. That's what we should call this episode. We should call it the blame it on the band episode. <laughs> um. Because it definitely, I mean, they don't have anything else to blame. <laughs> blame it on a sad song. Uh, well, actually, no, I'm just playing. I actually like this song pretty good. And uh, this is probably, I mean, I won't say it's the best song on the record because the best song on the record is Traveling Man. I just didn't like the idea of, you know, the idea of having the song on there, but traveling man is the best one on here um uh, and this song is probably second <clears throat> to me and then we ain't much different it's third and the rest is all in a big heap of crap together to me all hunched up but um anyway so this song um uh, 536 and um 
and you feel every second of it. Like it is, it is just horrible. That's a Devin. That's a Devin Dungan quote from a while back. Oh, let's see. That's Blame because you the- do feel every second of it. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, Blame it on the too long, song. too long, too long, and you feel it. So back to you, Devin. Oh, all righty. I just cut Steven off, and now he tossed it back to me. So, Bernice. So, Steven, take. None of us are free. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, this album should have been free. Sold everywhere free. Because, uh, I mean, five minutes and 22 seconds of nothing. And, uh. I mean, nope. they should have they, they should have released this record like and just ripped off people and and just put the album cover on there and just put nothing on the on the disc and just and just ripped <laughs> off everybody that bought it <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then just like half the price and just mark it down for like five dollars like five dollars and twenty cents or something and then um and then sell it at CD Warehouse and Mobile, and then but if you did that, then they would overcharge you, and uh, it make you pay like twenty five bucks for it. But that's beside it's the point. Rare import. Yeah, yeah, right. And uh, and then basically, I mean, this this is like this makes Molly this this how this album makes Molly Hatchet look like. I mean, just great. I mean, oh, it's oh. almost like. It's, I mean, it's almost like this record is just a, <laughs> just a some a, a cover band trying to mine Molly Hatchet. So back to you. <laughs> oh my! So we close this album out with "How Soon We Forget." So once again, reminds me of Zeppelin in the opening. This is actually a good song. I like it. This is classic Skinner to me. A good closer to the record, but does have outside songwriters, but it actually, to me, works on here. The lyrics, I will say, sing, if, if it was written lyrically by someone else, I'm not sure if anybody else. I, I'm not sure who got credited for lyrics. I'm sure Johnny Van Zant wrote a lot of the lyrics, but if there were, like, song doctors come in or whatever to, to redo the lyrics or whatever, it kind of seems at times like these, these outside songwriters, if they were the ones to write the lyrics, they're writing what they think Southern people would write for a song. It seems like they're trying to rip off Skinner in some ways. And to me, one of the best songs on the record, kind of, it kind of goes by fast, which I like, and I like the message of the song. So, yeah, solid song. I dig it. So a good closure to the record. So Stephen bashed this song. Oh man, I mean, this this is just this is this is like another. Uh, this is something else that's completely different from the rest of this because it kind of has this like kind of feel that that really um, it'd be believable that maybe Ronnie even wrote it, like Ronnie Van Zant. And, uh, like, because it has that kind of feel to it, the songwriting. Something that might be off of, like, say, Second Helping or the first album or something like that. Probably more the first album, but it sounds like that sort of style production. Kind of, like, more, I don't know, rough sounding. But, anyway, as far as the sound of it. Uh, studio wise see what I mean it's like the slide stuff but um, acoustic wise oh, yes and also and also the, the style of it kind of reminds me of um, you know like the band the way the band is set up and all is uh, I think it was take your uh, take your whiskey home or something like that it was called by Van Halen that's what that's what the, the the production sounds like to me. That's what it reminds me of. But um, anyway, so oh, the way it starts anyway. So back to you, Doug. Oh, 
All righty, so wait, there is more. So I don't think you've actually heard this song. So there is a bonus track for the Japanese version called Sign of the Time. So they're ripping off Quiet Riot now with the song titles. I'm just kidding. Well, it's, it's nothing like that song. I actually like this song. I think it could have fit right at home on the record. I think they could have tossed one of the crappy songs off and put this on here. It gives off kind of an interesting vibe. Reminds me a bit of Blackfoot. I, I kind of put further on down in my notes. Would have been better as a Blackfoot song or maybe a Molly Hatchet song and some good acoustic guitar work on here. Sounds a bit like old school Skinner. Chorus is pretty good, but I could do without the hey, hey crap. There's some hey, hey's in the beginning of the chorus. Not a fan of that. And harmonica solo, as far as I know, that's played by Ricky Metlock. And this song, if I'm not bad wrong, this dates back to the 91 sessions because I have the complete 91 sessions on CD. I got it off of eBay a long time ago. And it, it's like four discs of nothing but 1991 sessions and demos and stuff. And this is on there. I, originally, I thought it was an instrumental, but I was wrong. So, yeah, Stephen, have you heard this song or is this kind of like you don't know anything about this? One? No, Secondhand Night is, is a bad song. Oh, my. So. That's the end of the album, so I will give my conclusion on the record. Overall, I think this is a 7 out of 10 for me. A good return to form for the band. I think they could have shaved a few songs off of this, and it would have been a lot better than it was. This is CD Age. I, I, like I said, I've said it before in prior episodes. I'm a big proponent of the rule of 10 when you're putting the CD together. I mean, it... it when CDs were introduced, it was kind of a blessing and a curse a lot of times because bands were back in the day recording to vinyl, which I believe is 30 minutes a piece. So it's a, if you had a double album, it was nearly an hour. And I think that's that to me is kind of the weakness of CDs a lot of times is that they're trying to jam all they can onto a CD. And a lot of times I think it just it. it it kills the record more than it does anything else. I think a lot, a lot of stuff gets lost in the shuffle compared to back in the day. You had a good eight or nine or, or two, good strong ten song record, and I think this is a big, big example. And all of these records are extremely long. Like, like I, I talk a little bit about the post plane crash albums in a few minutes, but I mean. A lot of them are very long, and this is one of the best releases of the post-crash lineup. I'd, I'd probably say The Last Rebel is the best, and then this is second best for me. And it was followed up in 1998 by a live album, which is actually really, really good, called Live from Steel Town. It's this lineup, and there's some songs from this album on there. I've heard, I remember hearing it back in the day. There's also a video counterpart to it. I've been, I've been wanting to really order that CD and, and have it because it's actually a really, really strong live record. And the studio record is um, that followed this album is not good. I'll, I'll get there in a few minutes. And it's pretty much this part too, but worse. And yeah, it did go 97 on the Billboard 200, which I kind of find surprising. But I will get into just real quick the... the post crash albums so i mean 91 to me is kind of subpar there's some good songs on there but there's also a lot of filler the last rebel to me is a great record i think that's a good return to form and then endangered species is really strong this one's a it's it's a good record i think they could have shaved some stuff off of it and made it shorter and i think it would have been a much better record the Edge of Forever's crap, Vicious Cycle's crap. I think Vicious Cycle would have been a good a good album if they would have shaved a lot of songs off of that because I think that's like 16 songs long, which is way too long for an album. And then God and Guns, we've reviewed it on the channel before. Go check that out. 
I, I like some songs, and there's a lot of it's kind of subpar to me. It's kind of like 91 for me. I think it's kind of subpar. And Last of the Dying Breed, I actually really love that record. That's a really, really strong record. So, Stephen, your conclusion to this record review? Oh. Uh... I mean, this review was very entertaining, and uh, besides, I mean, the stuff that's not going to make it to this episode, just know that there was some stuff that was left out, (laughs) but uh, I mean, for the purposes of this record, I would not listen to it again, and I will not. Because if I'm forced to, then no. No, I'm not going to do it. I mean, this is not good. This is is not good. Not good. Not good. Not good. Uh, (laughs) my, My brain has shut off and my rating is... Negative three out of ten. So. Oh my! No more. No more. Back to you, Doug. All righty. So now on to. So I'm gonna change up here. So I used to call it pick of the week or picks of the week, but that's actually that's an origin that's originated from. Rock, the great rock and metal combat podcast with Ralph Vieira and Ian Wadley, Wadzilla. And I'm going to try something different. It may sound stupid. If it does sound stupid, I will not continue to use this. But choice cuts of the week. That's going to be what I'm, I'm going to call it for right now. It may be stupid. I may just stop doing it and just say we may need to do, with, do away with the picks of the week or whatever. But mine is going to be. The 1998 record and the Soul Studio record by the band Two. So this was a project by Rob Halford and John Five. And this is an industrial record. They put out the album Warriors. And it's actually a really strong album. And a lot of it, it split people right down the middle. A lot of people hated. A lot of people really enjoyed. And I happen to really love this record. It's a really, really dark album. But it's like, I, I like some albums like that. And this is very much one of them. And my movie cut of the week is the Blues Brothers extended cut. So this is all that's left of the roadshow cut. So there was originally a four hour long version of the Blues Brothers that is lost, that no one has it. So this is the only thing left from that cut of the movie. And, yeah, that's my choice cuts of the week. So, Stephen, what are your quote-unquote choice cuts of the week? Let me guess, anything but this. (laughs) My choice is love is a killer. I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) My choice is Bernie Morrison. And, uh, no, my choice is White Snake. Let's see. Is it night? Is it eighty nine or something like that? It's called. I don't know. Can't remember. It's one of those like that. I'm thinking about. But nineteen uh, eighty seven. Seven. I don't know why I said nine. Yeah, eighty seven. That one. And then for music. And then because um, White Snake has been, I've been somewhat interested in as of late, and um, I'm just trying new crap too. And then for a movie, I would say something along the lines of Jason Goes to Hell. So, yeah. no, back to you, Devin. All righty. You, you, you sound drained. This review drains you. That's the episode, guys. See you next time.